came out. My aunt went in and talked to her son. And she talked to her other boys and asked if I'd done anything with them. And one said, well, sometimes we weren't sleeping. She didn't know what to do. She went to my oldest sister and, and told her what had happened. Oh, we talked about it. She said, well, what's Hilly's decided to do is this. If you agree to go to the bishop, you know, in her war to talk to him, I know they have psychologists who can help people like this. If you'll do that, she won't press police charges, but if you won't call the police and have them come in on it. And so I says, it sounds good. Within a church setting, molestation is common. It's more common than we would like to know. Unfortunately, in my clinical practice, I have certainly treated folks that have been molested as children, um, as part of their LDS faith community. Most of these events, if they're taken to any sort of church leadership, are not reported to the police. And so the numbers that we have are too low to even represent what's actually going on. The Mormon church believes that these things should be dealt with inside of the church. I went and talked to the bishop and he, he sent me down to some psychologists. So we saw each other and this satisfied my aunt, my sister, and after a few times they even quit asking about it. And because of that, there's no follow-up. Certainly no police intervention from happening. And uh, I quit going to him. But uh, for the most part, that was pretty well the end of church activity for me. There's not going to be any built-in protections for future children or even the, the child that has experienced this heinous trauma. I know that Doc was devout, but this was the tipping point, and it really upset him that this was swept under the rug by the Mormon church. I was kind of left alone. The sexual fantasies I have, I can make happen now if I want. The first time I heard about the bishop, the Salt Lake City office of the FBI contacted me to tell me they had arrested somebody who they had evidence to believe had abducted, sexually assaulted, and murdered uh, several children. I was an expert in crimes against children, and he wanted to know whether I could help him out with the case. And all of a sudden, I don't know why, but, but I found myself very sexually interested in him. So I kind of squeezed him. At that point, he pushed my hand away. He said, I'm going to tell mommy. And I thought, what if I get caught? I don't dare let him go. I should let him go, but I don't dare. Suddenly, I see this prison life coming up. I really felt he was going to tell his mom. You're feeling a sense of panic, partly because question goes to your mind, what if someone catches me right now because of the fear of being caught and of going to prison and the things you had heard about prison? They would say, you know what these guys in prison do to you? If, if you're a child molester, you know, they really make it dirty. That was one thing on my mind is, hey, rather than go to prison, I'll kill him and that way I we won't need to worry about this down the road. An interesting theme in this story that is told by Gary Bishop is that he almost seems to want to do something that is so terrible that he will receive an enormous punishment and get it over with already because he lives throughout his entire life anxious that he's going to be punished by the people around him, by God, and so forth. So the logic is, why don't I do something bad enough that then I'm finally just labeled terrible and then I don't need to keep fighting this anymore. Doc believed that after that first kill, that's another dividing line. There were four missionaries in that area, and we usually came home for about two hours during midday and would have our lunch and study before we went out again 
And I was really down. I, all I know is I wanted out. So I, I kind of half hinted before when I talked to Brent Smith that I wanted to leave, but he didn't think that was a good idea. Uh, so I went out and I bought a big bottle of aspirin and uh, took it home and took them all. That was at noon that I took them. So I was on our noon break. Forty other guys went out, and when they left, I just said, "Hey, I'm not feeling well." At that time, they had a policy that if one companion was ill, the other companion could go out with the other pair, you know, and get some missing time in, unless the other companion was too sick to be left alone. I know I just laid on the bed, and uh, and then all of a sudden I got really nauseous, and. Uh, I threw up in a wastebasket that was there several times. And I just laid and rested and nothing happened. I started feeling better. I knew that, well, that didn't work. So that was a serious suicide attempt. I've taught myself you don't show this, you don't show how much it's hurt, and you learn how to bury that so deep and so well that uh, you cannot feel real emotions. You don't know what a real emotion is anymore. Okay. Uh, th that's that's yeah. theorizing, but... Uh, yeah, but that's um, something, I think, that is really the gist of this whole study. That is, how can we as human beings become calloused, or how can we get to the point where we don't feel it, or how can Do you we? think a, a conscience is something a person is born with, or is it a learned behavior? I think it's learned. Did I ever learn it? Or did I, somewhere along the line, things began to happen, and I unlearned? No. Like, for example, the other night I was thinking about uh, a story I'd heard, this was in fourth or fifth grade, called A Little Match Girl, about the girl who went out and... Uh, sold matches and the kids teased her and eventually stole one of her shoes and she ended up freezing to death. I remember at that time, I felt so sad for that little girl. And yet everybody else said, well, that's okay. You know, she went to heaven and she saw these bright lights, you know, the hundreds and hundreds of candles, you know, and I thought, I know, but she's still dead. And uh, it's like society was telling you, build a shield over when something bad happens. Somebody dies or, you know, I guess relating to myself, when a pet dies, you build a shield. You don't, you don't let it hurt you. And I think somehow I learned over years and years to even when you kill a human, you do that. That's the only way you can survive. Did, did you hear anything from your parents or your family or anything? How long did it take? Well, one thing I had done when I was arrested, I says, I want to be arrested under the name of Roger Downs. I don't want to be arrested under my real name of Arthur Bishop. Says, I don't want people to know who I really am. Just showing how naive I really was. Uh, and they said, okay, um, we'll do that. I made two requests. I says, I will tell you things on two conditions. Number one, I'd be arrested under this name. And can't remember what the other one was now. I have to think about it. Joe Carroll, who's my attorney now, came in and talked to me and she said, have you got an attorney? And I go, no, I said, do you have the money to get one? I go, I doubt it. She says, how much do you have? I said, well, if I scraped everything I want to get out of my four or five thousand, goes, you'll be assigned an attorney. She says, I will volunteer to be your attorney. I will probably be assigned a case. She talks, she says, first of all, uh, the cops have, on that statement you made to police for the confession, you know, we talked a little bit about that. She goes, and so this isn't your real name. I go, no, I don't want my real name revealed. says, it will be. They've arrested you under this, but it will come out. The news media will find out who you are. So you want me to call your parents to tell them before it hits on the news? And so I says, okay, maybe you better. So she did and talked to him. And uh, I remember hearing somewhere along the line that their mom had made a comment. I wish he would have come home dead instead of this happening. You know, I can appreciate that. I wish I would have too. 